Hey everybody, this is Sheets, and we're going to be going over the UFC card from this weekend, uh, for this weekend. And this is going to be the first of two uh, DFS videos. This one is going to be just going over who the best plays are from a DraftKings uh, scoring perspective. And um, I'll give you a couple of little tips as far as lineup construction goes, but the majority of the lineup construction stuff is going to be in the second video, which is going to be either... Uh, tomorrow or first thing Saturday morning. As uh, I've discussed many times, um, MMA, uh, with the exception of maybe, I was going to say tennis, but they're very similar sports, actually. It's the, the difference between knowing who the best plays are and knowing who to play in act in spe specifically in those really, you know, high paying GPPs with thousands of entries. Uh, the difference between those two skill sets is is very wide. Um, so we're going to spend a separate video just on how to tweak around with the Sims and tweak around with the with the rules to come up with a good portfolio of lineups specifically to deal with the $150,000 first prize. But for now, um, let's go over the plays and, and who the good plays are. And it's a very intriguing card, you know, and... and uh, this this happens quite a bit when you play DFS, is that sometimes cards that don't have a lot of name value and for true MMA fans are really, really poor can be very intriguing DFS uh, slates. And it kind of works that way in all sports, really. Um, the difference between being a sports fan and a DFS fan or a fan of the teams and a fan of the players and a fan of the players or a fan of the slate, uh, they're, they're kind of different things. And... Um, one could say that, uh, knowing something about the sport and having a passion for the sport might end up sort of almost being a negative sometimes because, um, you get a little bit more biased than you, things like, you know, it messes with your brain a little bit, but that, that might be for another, another video, but there is a theme to this card, which, uh, we will come back to as we go fight by fight. Um, with respect to win conditions and, and wrestling and what scores well in DFS, because when you see a card like this, uh, you're not going to see a lot of, of high finishing rates. Uh, it's a 12 fight card and very few fights or very few fighters have a really, really strong inside the distance prop. So with, uh, you know, the average number of fights or the average percentage of fights going to decision being so high on this card, you're going to really want to prioritize what types of fighters are going to score well in fights that do not, you know, make it to uh, to the finish or or that make it to 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 the decision. And that involves wrestling. So uh, we have to keep that in mind as we go through these car this card is that you really want to prioritize the wrestlers uh, on a slate that's bereft of, of a lot of finishing upside. And we'll, we'll get to that pretty quickly. The other thing that I want to uh, tease you about is that my, my view on the main event this week is going to be very different, I think, than it usually is. And we'll, we'll get to that. You have to kind of sit there to the end before we go over that. So right off the bat, first fight of the night, it looks like a really sloppy, awful, you know, heavyweight fight. You have Muhammad Usman versus Thomas Peterson is 8,800 versus 7,400. And, you know, on the surface, it looks like this fight just kind of like a wash, right? It's like kind of a terrible uh, DFS fight. I mean, you look at Usman, Usman inside is plus 275, and that's kind of atrocious for his price. So if anything, you'd want to look at the Peterson side and his inside the distance line is plus 385. But but these, again, th this this card, it does not have a lot of finishing upside. So the next question you have to ask is whose win condition is more predicated upon the wrestling? Um, because that's going to pick up points regardless of the finish. And and Peterson is actually the fighter with, uh, with that win condition. Now, again, when I say win condition... I'm not saying he's going to win, right? I'm just saying that in this, in the, in the fights that he does win, he's going to score pretty well. Uh, even considering the fact that he's probably not going to finish. So, and when I also, when I say score pretty well, I mean, relative to what you're going to eat on this card, 
Okay, this card, if you haven't kind of felt this yet, does rate, at least in my estimation, to be a low-scoring DFS card. So you get a decision with a, cu with a couple of takedowns and 85 points um, on an underdog like this. It's going to be good enough, I think. So it, weirdly, Peterson actually rates to me to be the better of the DFS plays because Usman's win condition doesn't really come with takedowns and it doesn't really come with a lot of finishing upside. So can't really see too many reasons to pick him. So I think Peterson is certainly the the, the better DFS play um, uh, in this first fight. Um, Luana Carolina versus Lucia Putilova. This, um, unfortunately, is one of those fights that is in the mid-range, so you have to give it a little bit of respect. You know, like you look at the, the prices, 8,200, 8K, you know, especially on a low-scoring, um, projecting a low-scoring card. These 8,200, 8K fights are very important to give a little bit of extra credit to. But even still, I mean, the, the inside the distance line is just so, so poor for both sides. I mean, just we'll take a look at I think both sides are plus 500, maybe. Let's just see. Um, Carolina, Kudalota inside is plus 460. Carolina plus 480. That's atrocious. And with respect to the grappling upside, I mean, I guess Kudalova's win condition is more predicated on getting the takedowns than Carolina's. But... That's not to say that all of Pudalova's wins come with takedowns. I mean, she doesn't not really a great wrestler, and Carolina has stuffed some takedowns of some pretty good wrestlers. So I don't know. I, I just kind of feel this fight's sort of a pass. You know, um uh, if anybody, I guess Pudalova, because again, her win condition is more likely to involve takedowns than Carolina's, I suppose. Uh, but even even still, I mean, Carolina got some takedowns in her last fight, I believe, and actually got a finish off it by submission. I think. Um, anyway, uh, I think this fight's probably one of the one of the, one of the fights closest to a pass as far as the metrics go. The only thing that stops me from saying it's a full pass is because of that price. Um, so we'll have to we'll have to see how it fits with respect to um, with respect to uh, lineup construction as we get kind of closer to that. Um, ooh, I need really needed Brian Harmon to make that birdie, and he didn't. Crap. Um, okay, so um, let's see. Let me just pause this for just a second. Uh, sorry about that. So let's move on to Loic Rajabov versus uh, Trey Ogden. Uh, 8,400, 7,800, uh, mid-range... Uh, pricing so we're already giving it a little bit of respect and let's take a look at the inside the distance lines here um let's see rajaboff inside is plus 240 i mean it's not that bad for this price uh on this card it's usually you need like a much better than that um but on this card plus 240 is actually one of the better prospects i think there is uh ogden inside is really poor plus 500 so the the only thing left to consider is who has the um who has the uh who has the grappling upside like whose win condition is more predicated on um on uh on grappling because razabov is certainly has the better finishing upside and with respect to to that question i think both fighters have grappling upside. I mean, just a couple of fights ago, Loic Grazibov had like 11 takedowns. Um, and Trey Ogden, I mean, he can get takedowns as well. But I think that, 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 I think both these fighters could win this fight just kind of keeping it on the feet also. So it's not like they have to go for these takedowns. So uh, all that kind of thrown into the blender, so to speak, just means that Rajabov is just going to be the better play here. And, and obviously a pretty good play as well. Um, again, normally uh, takedown upside plus a plus 240 inside the distance line with his price is, is good, but not elite. I think on this card, it's almost bordering on elite. So uh, let's, let's put, um, let's keep track of who we like here. So Peterson, 
nobody in the women's fight, then let's put Rajbov here at 8,400. I'm moving along. Dion Barboza versus Miranda Maverick. Uh, this is going to be a tough spot for, for Maverick in DFS. Uh, she's minus 220. Her price is, you know, 9,200. So what you're going to need from her is, is, um, is either an inside the distance line of around minus 110, but not on this card, maybe it might be plus 110. And or a good amount of grappling upside. And I'll tell you, the more intriguing part of that is the latter. Because Maverick inside the distance is plus 400. That's just like, that's atrocious. But huh, does she really have the takedown upside? Is that is that necessarily going to be how she gets this done? And I'm just not, I'm not sure about that. You know, I'm just not sure about that. She has... In her listen, in her in her last two fights, she certainly got that done. You know, she had three takedowns against Andrea Lee. She had three takedowns against Catchuera, leading to a sub. But Catchuera is literally the nut low with respect to defending grappling. She got involved in a tough fight with Jazz Davicius, who is also a really strong grappler. He looks at five takedowns from Sh to Sh against Shannon Young, five take four takedowns to Sabina Mazzo. I guess so. You know, I, I guess that, um, again, I guess that, uh, well, look at this. The, her only loss was the, one, was the one she didn't get any takedowns. So I presume that this is going to be her path to victory. She's going to try to get these takedowns. Now, Barboza apparently is pretty big or whatever, but um, so it's possible that Miranda Maverick doesn't get the takedowns. It's just good enough on the feet to win striking. And, of course, if that happens, then the fight's going to bust. But I don't know. Again, we're kind of like hunting for for upside here on this card, and I think that if if she ends up somehow getting low owned, uh, then I think she's actually going to be really really good play here. Now Barboza, um, because like I said, because Maverick is probably not going to be all that popular, uh, I don't think that there's too many reasons to play her. Um, look, she's she's uh, her inside the distance line is no good. She's not going to really go for takedowns. The only way that she you can be justified is just getting leverage against a popular fighter, really. And and I don't I don't think that Maverick fits that bill. But we'll we'll see how ownership kind of plays out as we um as we get down to uh to the end here. Um okay, just one more thing. No way he gets a birdie, right? Heaven forbid. Um okay. Let's move on. Uh, Cody Gibson versus Brian Kelleher. Um, okay. The problem here, among other things, is that his his win odds, Gibson's, are not that great. He's minus 200, and he is 9,300 on the board. I mean, for him to be a good play, I mean, normally I would say he needs at least maybe a minus 150 inside the distance or – Minus 120, 115 plus uh take that upside. I'll settle for for one of them. You know what I mean? Like if, if I knew that he was gonna always go for takedowns and, and be aggressive, uh, that might even be good enough for me to get to him. But let's see the inside the distance line. Cause he even minus 110, I certainly hope so. Otherwise, it's gonna be very difficult for me to justify playing him. Um let's see. Gibson inside, I mean, plus 110. I mean, I guess it's possible that he can get takedowns. I, I, I guess he's got to be in play on a card like this. I mean, this is the problem. I mean, like, uh, I think he has to be sort of in play. I think that a natural comparison is going to be to Maverick. Except I think that it's more likely that Maverick goes for the takedowns than than what's his name than than Gibson. Not that Gibson won't, but I don't know. I don't know. I, maybe he might. Maybe he fears Kelleher's guillotine a little bit, so he might go not go for as many takedowns. Um. So I think he's kind of okay. I still prefer Maverick for some reason, though. All right, Hyder Emil versus John Young Lee. 
uh, minus 200 versus plus 165. Is there a is line value here? Oh, let's see. No, not really. So John Lee is 9,100. And again, these are the kind of the, the baselines. Normally, a $9,100 fighter, we would want to have, um, you know, uh, you'd want to have a 110 inside the distance line, minus 110 inside the distance line, or possibly have some wrestling upside to go with a little less of an inside the distance line. But I don't think that Lee really looks that good here. Um, so Lee inside, like plus 140. It just it's just not quite good enough. It just isn't. And, and he doesn't really have the takedown upside. Hyder Emil is sort of interesting though. I mean, he's plus 170. He has a decent amount of win odds, I guess, for his price. And he is very aggressive. See you later. And he's very aggressive. Um that we have that going for him. Um he's not very active, you know, and fight all that much, but he always brings it when he comes. So, so, so again, we talk about win condition. If he is going to win this fight, he's probably going to score pretty well. So, I think that Hyder Emil at seventy one hundred is probably a pretty good punt. Um, um, so it, it's it's a similar but different play than Peterson, right? Peterson, I like because in his wins, I know that he's going to have to wrestle and score well. And Emil, I know in his wins, it's going to be because his aggression was good enough to win. And aggression leads to fantasy points. It leads to volume. It leads to, you know what I mean? It leads to other stuff. It leads to knockouts. So I do like Emil as, as a kind of a decent punt here. All right, moving on. We have Bill Algio versus Duho Choi. Bill Algio minus 160, Ochoi 140. Let's just, again, we're just going to double check to make sure that there are there's no money line value somewhere that we're missing. No, not really. Algio eighty nine hundred. That's a healthy price tag. Um, so again, we have to we have to really be greedy here at eighty nine hundred. I mean, let's see what his inside the distance line is. Um, inside the dis plus three hundred. That's just terrible. You know he he's got to if he's gonna he's gonna trot out with a plus three hundred inside the distance line at that price. You better be damn sure that he's gonna get there in some other way. You know whether it be by takedowns. Or a lot of volume. Um, maybe. Okay, I mean, Algio can do both of those things. You know, he against Andre Feely had 151. You know, uh, significant 151 strikes uh, against Lamas, 145 strikes. So he does put up volume every once in a while, and also every once in a while he could put up some takedowns. Ah. But I don't know. It just it, for that price, it just seems so. He needs everything to go right. I think for him to get there, I'm gonna I'm gonna consider him a borderline play. I guess. Um, if if I knew he was gonna go for the wrestling, great. Uh, if I, but even if he doesn't get the wrestling, can he get the volume? 110 significant strikes. Actually, it's only 151 regulars. It's 81 significant strikes. It just feels he's the, the, the that the play is just a little thin. Okay, so I'm probably going to end up passing on both sides of this. Uh, well, let's just double check. Let's see what Duhu Choi's uh, inside the distance line is. I imagine it can't be better than plus 140 or plus 400 or something like that. Let's see. Um, Duhu Choi, actually, eh, plus 320. I guess that's okay. And he's going to be really low owned. I guess that's something. Um, boy, I, I know I'm going to end up getting to some of him in, in, in MME, but is Algio going to be popular? No. Are you getting leverage? No. All right. I guess for his win odds and his inside the distance line. All right. We'll put him in for now. It's a punt, but I, I have a feeling he's going to be, He's going to drop off. You know, I think I like these others better. Uh, Emil and Peterson, I think. One thing we have not seen, by the way, is a uh, is a good leverage play yet from the underdogs, right? Because we haven't really, but then again, we haven't really thought about who the, who the highest known players are going to be. So funny. We've been through this and, and who, who is going to be that high owned? 
if everybody looks so bad, I guess the main event, are people going to end up playing Gibson and Maverick and, 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 oh, I don't know. Uh, all right, let's, uh, let's move on. We have Bruno Silva against Cody Durden. This is a this is a very intriguing uh, DFS fight. You have the the, the pricing is kind of pr is pristine, right? Eighty three hundred, seventy nine hundred is exactly what you want to see. Um, you, you're already giving it kind of a you know, kind of a break, and not only that, but but you know you have some pretty cool win condition situations here. So, like you look at the inside the distance line, I can't imagine that that anybody's gonna be have such a great inside the distance line like Durden plus five hundred. Silva plus 200. So so he clearly has the better finish, you know, finishing potential, okay? And even just on this, this is probably a a good play. So now we have to talk about Jordan cuz Jordan is not doesn't have a lot of finishing upside, but he's going to be going for a whole bunch of takedowns. And you know, that is going to score very very well in his wins. Um but the other thing about this fight, which is kind of intriguing, is that is that Silva has uh, some pretty good submission skills. So in those variations where, what's his name, where um, Durden goes for takedowns to try to attain his win condition, it opens up another kind of win condition for, uh, for Bruno Silva in that maybe getting a submission or some reversals even, okay? So Silva's got a ton of upside here. And 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 Durden obviously has a ton of upside with all of his uh all of his takedowns. So this fight, I think, is is a, a kind of a must play fight. Okay. I really think that the winner here is going to be very, very difficult to be kept off the optimal. I think if anything, I would say that um that Durden is has the more fragility here because I think Durden could get a boring Durden type, you know, uh, decision and not quite get there, maybe with like an 85 or something like that. Um, uh, and he's being the and he as the favorite, you know, is uh, at 8,300, he needs a little bit more. So I think that 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 you want to play both sides of this with Silva probably being the preferred of the two, but definitely this is the first of the key fights. So let's, um, who do you want to put in for, uh, put in silver, whatever. And obviously we're not going to do this and leave 2,700 on the table. Although, you know, th this could end up being the nuts, you know, uh, it's very possible. Uh, well, we'll get to the main event in a minute though. All right. Uh, so we have, um, Cayman Krzyzewski versus Kurt Hollibaugh. Um, all right, 8,700 versus 7,500 here. And the first thing I guess to notice is that, again, it's pretty poor win odds on the on the favorite, you know? And this is kind of this whole card, is is that there aren't that many huge favorites. And the way the pricing model works on DraftKings, they kind of have to give, you know, $9,100 price tag to some people at 92, 93. And so you'll end up getting some pretty bad value. I mean, uh, I don't want to say relative bad value. I'm going to say uh, non-relative. You know, it's uh, the word I'm looking for. Static bad value, I guess, on uh, on these favorites because they, if you're pricing someone to 9,200, they should be like minus 300 or better. But on a relative value scale, you know, you're still saying who's the biggest favorite of them all. But all of these underdogs, you could say, are good kind of DFS money line value plays. Um, and I guess this fight would be no exception, um, that Halabah does have pretty good money line value for his price. Now let's take a look at the inside the distance lines and stuff. We have Halabah inside plus 220. Boy, oh boy. And Krzyzewski plus 150. So I guess this is another fight that is just going to have to be keyed here. Um, specifically... Boy, this Holobos side, I mean, whether you like this side or not, I mean, the metrics are just insanely strong. Um, $7,500 fighter with an inside the distance line of, what did I say? Plus 225? I mean, that's pretty strong. 
So I think that he's a really good play. And, and Krzyzewski, Krzyzewski could get takedowns as well alongside of this, of the pretty decent inside the distance line. So this is another key fight here. I, I would definitely play someone from, from both sides of this fight as well. So let's, uh, let's get rid of Choi for a minute. And let's put in Halaba uh, as a very, as a very, very strong underdog. Um, as a matter of fact, I mean, Halaba, Silva, you know, then, then I think these guys are better than say Peterson and Emil, but uh, this, is a, this is a pretty good pool of underdogs that we're kind of building here. All right, we have uh, Steve Garcia versus Xiong Wu Choi. Okay, minus 145, plus 125. And Garcia's 8,600, 7,600. That seems reasonable. And Garcia, I imagine, has got to have a good inside the distance line. Let's just see. Wow, here we go. Garcia inside, minus 110 at 8,600. Let's go. So far, best play on the board, okay? Uh, and then you have Wu Choi on the other side, like plus 180 or so inside. And his price is 7,600. Let's go. Um, again, like you had to suffer through some of these like bad fights to get here. But as we get down the stretch here, like you get these key fights that you can play. And and this is a, this is a big one, right? So either one of these fighters works. Uh, depending on the other guys in your lineups, Garcia Choi definitely, definitely a strong uh, DFS uh, uh, target. Okay, uh, what do we got? Just a couple left here. Yep. So we have Brad Tavares against John Young Park, uh, the uh, Iron Turtle, and John Young Park is minus one sixty, and he's another one of those guys that's priced up a little bit too high. He's nine K. We'll take a look at the inside the distance line here. And I, I imagine you're going to be very disappointed um, with this. Um, well, if you were thinking of playing it. Yep, Jun Young Park inside is plus 240, which is obviously really bad for 9K. The only thing is that how much of his win condition is going to be based on his ability to wrestle. Um, He could win this fight by doing, by, you know, uh, getting takedowns or he could win this fight by staying on the feet. So it's not like his win condition is predicated on him getting takedowns. Uh, it's, it's certainly, I would say in the range of outcomes and maybe, I don't know what, what's it, what is it? 40% of his wins maybe are going to be due to takedowns and 60% are going to be due to some other way. I'm not sure, but I feel as though he's probably not as good of a play as say Maverick, for example. And when you combine the Gibson uh, possibility of getting takedowns plus his better inside the distance line, I don't think the park is better than Gibson either. So I don't really like park too much at all here. Uh, and Tavares on the other side, again, park's not going to be particularly popular. So you're not going to get a lot of leverage there. And his inside the distance line is terrible. So uh, this fight's probably going to be pretty close, if not completely a pass. So we get to the main event here and, uh, here, here's the thing. I, I usually like to try to fade the main event, okay, when I get down to it, just because I know it's going to be so popular. But I, I don't see a universe that this fight doesn't make the optimal. Um, So I, I'm probably going to end up going 100% on this fight. And I, I really, at the beginning of the week, at the beginning of the week, I, I was... I was all ready to come on this, you know, this podcast three days later. And you know, I thought about this Monday and just basically say to just lock in Van, uh, Jan Daroba. Uh, it's, it's just a, a perfect DFS play. You know, it, is she going to win? I don't know, but, but she's minus minus one twenty, So about 60, about 54, 52% of the time she's going to win. And when she wins, boy, oh boy, is she going to score? You know what I mean? Because she's not winning a striking-based battle. The only way she's going to win is getting a bunch of takedowns and doing enough with them to secure the decision. Now, you'll notice that I added that and do enough with them to secure the decision because, yeah, I mean, it's possible that the judges are, you know, biased against wrestlers now that they don't do much with their with their takedowns. But remember, I'm already presuming she's going to win in that part of the, the discussion. So presuming she wins... 
it's going to be because she overcame all of that and probably did enough with the takedowns to to overcome that bias. So, I mean, what is she going to score in a win? I mean, you you almost want it to go five rounds for her. I mean, she gets you get five rounds of a of a of a Jandarova win. What is that? One hundred and fifty points. I mean, I don't know. It's 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 a ton. So uh, I was almost going to just say, just lock her in for 100% because her wind condition is so strong. But uh, because of the nature of this card, a Lemos win, how is that not getting there? You know, like like, like Lemos, she is 7,700. How is she going to win? I mean, she's going to have to get enough volume or, or a, a finish. And all of those things are probably going to be good enough when you combine with the amount of strikes she's going to have to put up there, and listen, Vanderova or Janderova, whatever, she's not particularly um, responsible defensively. And so if Lemos gets stuff going, it's going to be a ton of significant strikes. So I well, I still think I just want to lock in Janderova. You know what you do? You lock in Janderova and then play all their kinds of stuff. And if you're live to Janderova... Uh, then you just bet a ton on 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 Lemos in the in in the betting markets or something as the as the underdog. That that actually might not be the worst idea in the world, um, because I know that Jan Robe is like the nut DFS play. Now the only problem is going to be her ownership. I mean, I, how is she not fifty percent owned given everything that I just said? Um, but uh, I don't know. So, but but listen, I, I think that that because she could be very popular that Lemos really you need to kind of play some of her um, to get leverage. So I would say, I don't know, 80% Vanderova, Janderova, 20% Lemos, maybe a little 70, 30 or something. But to me, Janderova is, I mean, just her win condition just always is always in the optimal in this. It, I can't say always, cause you know, always is a tough, tough word, but, but, it's very, very likely that when she wins, she's in there. Um, like Garcia, for example, I would say he gets in there most of the time, but not all the time. You can get a third round knockout and not get in there, you know? You have, who else? Razabov? I mean, Razabov could win a, you know, a fight where he ends up getting a couple of takedowns and winning a decision for like 90 points. I mean, he's not always going to get in there. What other guys do we talk about here? I mean, obviously all those other favorites like Gibson, he's not always going to get in there on his wins. Maverick, not always. So uh, it's kind of hard for me to dispute <laughs> uh, Jan as being the best play on the slate, uh, even though she's probably going to be the most popular. All right, that should do it. Uh, stay tuned tomorrow for a betting breakdown, which was definitely the most successful part of last week's videos. We did that's a couple of really good underdogs there. And then um, either, either tomorrow night or Saturday morning, we'll do the uh, the uh, the lineup construction video. Hope this helped, and good luck, everybody.